And we wanted to say a few things from yesterday too that we didn't get to say. Um, one was, uh, firstly, Jen, I would really like to thank you actually for bringing up yeah. what you brought up. Yeah. You're very brave and very honest. Um, one thing that I'd like to say to the rest of the audience about that is that one reason why Jen, you, all of you have noticed discernible progress in Jen over the last six to 12 months. And the one reason why that you've noticed that is because Jen is very open to actually just saying the truth every single time. And many of us are still avoiding saying the truth every single time. And it triggers lots of us because we don't want to say the truth ourselves. Yeah. So it's really wonderful you did that, Jen. And uh, so I just want to congratulate Jen for doing that. And being really blunt and open about your feelings. You're kind of shy of me now. <laughs> I love you, my sister. <laughs> All right. Um, just regarding morality, issues of morality. Most people on earth and in the spirit world on spiritual paths do not understand how important morality is in terms of spiritual progression. And this is why all through religious history there has been channelings from the spirit world about you must do this and you must not do that. And the reason why these things like the Ten Commandments, for example, were stated in the Bible is because there are certain parts of those commandments that have a relationship to issues of morality. And the majority of people on earth generally ignore issues of morality. And what I've found is in the New Age spiritual movement, there's often a, a, a very strong emphasis on not worrying about morality at all. And in fact, you know, having every sexual experience you possibly can and every, you know, all of these different experiences without concern for what's actually happening at the soul level to the soul. And so that's a very important thing to bear in mind in your progression towards God, is that in the end we do have to learn issues of morality. Now, you'll notice that when it comes to sex between partners, if there's love involved, I have a very permissive attitude. But when it comes to sex between multiple partners, or one's, one person after another, I have a very... Uh, I suppose you could say firm attitude towards that because I know how much the soul degrades during those kind of things. And there are literally millions and millions, in fact billions of spirits in the hells of the first fear who are there because of their sexual conduct while they are on earth. Right? So it's very, very important to understand that the majority of those people in those places are people who have a lot of trouble getting out of those places. In the Paget messages, there was a message from Helen, who was um, Mr. Paget's wife, who passed into the spirit world. And James Paget asked Helen, what was the hardest emotional injuries to get over? And she began talking about ones who had murdered and ones who had done <coughs> other things. But then she said, the hardest person, the hardest person to help was the person she called the prostitute. And then, he, and then she clarified that, saying she wasn't talking about people who were prostitutes while they were on earth. What she was talking about is people who used their sexual desires on earth in a very open and permissive way and prostituted their bodies right, in order to get feelings. And she described that that condition was the hardest condition to help in the spirit world. And in fact, it's also the hardest condition of a person to help here in many times too, because we can become, you know, we come so we know that sex is good, right? So then we go down the track of actually saying, well, sex with anyone is good, therefore sex with all people is good, and we just take that down into the extreme and then practice that, not understanding how many addictions we're covering over while we're doing that. So it's very, very important if you want to progress on any spiritual path to understand the relationship between sex, the addictions, and spiritual development. And so it's very important that you grasp, even at least intellectually, that when you go along with your sexual desires without understanding them and without acting in harmony with love, what actually happens is your soul condition does degrade. 
And because it's such a pleasurable experience, it's very, very easy to get addicted to it. And also, it's a very socially now becoming socially acceptable experience. So more and more, there we're becoming an open society, which is a very good thing when it comes to sexuality. But if we then use that as an excuse for permissiveness, what's going to happen is our soul condition will degrade. And so this is where we need to see the relationship between sex and our desires and our addictions and, and how we often operate in our addictions rather than in love. And remember, sex with love is obviously a lot different, but how do you tell you're being loving? It's very hard sometimes, isn't it? Because all you have is this burning need sometimes to just to be touched or a burning need to be you know, held or cuddled or a burning need to interact with a person on an emotional level, which we often then misplace with sex and think that getting, having sex with somebody will actually give us that. And the majority of times we come away from those relationships or those one-night stands or those different sexual acts that we do very, very disappointed. And the reason why is because we're often substituting <coughs> sex for what the real thing we're looking for is, which is often affection, love, unconditional love, unconditional acceptance, and a lot of other things. And we're often substituting sex for that. Does that make sense to everyone? So less yesterday, when we had that conversation, what happened is that there were, I don't know if you felt it, but there was a real uh, feeling of anger, in fact, uh, for, for many in the audience, of, of, of feeling judged about their own sexual practices. And I'm not judging anyone's sexual practices. I'm just saying that while we engage in sexual practices that are unloving, what actually happens is our soul degrades. And we need to be aware that that's the case. And that's why we mention things like sexually deviant behaviour, sexual enslavement, sexual denial of self, sexual addictions, unloving sexual practices to obtain arousal and all those kind of things. That's why we've mentioned them. Because they are all things that actually degrade the soul condition. And I'm not saying deny them. I'm saying totally see where, what we're doing. So, you know, if we're into pornography, yes, I'm into pornography. Why am I into pornography? Go deeper into that emotionally. But, and, and then, you know, if you're into threesomes, you know, Look at that seriously. What's going on with that? Why do you need three people to have sex with rather than two, just the two of you? What's going on there? What's going on emotionally? If you're into orgies, what's going on emotionally there? What, what is being attracted there? Because all of those situations also attract lots of spirits in the same condition to those events. And many times we get highly aroused, not because those situations are actually arousing to us, but because spirits are often interfering with our arousal process through those interactions. And so we need to be very careful, if we want to maintain our soul condition, we need to be very careful what we choose. So and, uh, recognize the desire, let yourself feel even the desires that you have, let yourself even imagine them through fantasies and all those kind of things, but then go deeper into the emotion. What emotion is driving this? You allow yourself to feel the underlying emotion. Is that, everyone follows that? Let yourself do that. And there were quite a number in the audience yesterday who felt quite a large amount of judgment about that. So for those of, you, of them who are not here today, and hopefully they might see this session and, and uh, understand that I'm not judging them for their actions, but rather saying go deeper into the emotion if those things are prevalent in your sex life. Looking especially gorgeous today. <laughs> Sorry. It's <laughs> getting distracted. Um, <laughs> the other things we didn't cover yesterday was sex from God's perspective and sex and physical and sexual attraction. We covered some of that material, but I'd like to cover some of that today uh, before we answer some questions which people have given us already and which you might like to be involved in as well. One thing I'd like to do, though, is just draw... Just draw a. Um, <coughs> yours is quite low. Which one do you? And what I'd like to do is just show you what's going on at the spirit body level when you're in a when you have a sexual attraction. 
So imagine this is your body, if you like. You're, now I'm talking about your spirit body. And this is the person you're attracted to, spirit body. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, of course, the soul is the container of the emotion. So the soul is the real you. So that's got the container of emotion. But what happens, remember, you've got chakra points, haven't you? All the way up through your body. Agreed? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Now, they are not the only energy points or the en entry or exit points of energy from your body, but they are the meridians where the most energy exits and enters. And you have it both on the front of your body and on the rear of your body. Right? Now, each the operation of each of these chakras depends very, very much on the emotions underlying each chakra. Now, the more... The more connections that you can have with another person. So the other person has got the same chakras, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The other person's got the same chakras as well. And the more connection points you can have with the other person at this level, at this energetic level, means that the more emotional energy flows through you at that particular point. So let's say I'm a woman and I've got I've got an anger with man, men. I've got anger with men. Now, anger is usually affecting our second or third chakras a lot. Let's say underneath the anger, in the first and second chakras, I've got some issues with wanting to feel special. In other words, I have a feeling or emotion in me where I'm not special as a woman and I want to feel special. So, and let's say this man comes along and he's got He's got, in, in this chakra, a feeling that he deserves a woman's anger. Right? So in other words, he feels very ashamed of himself being a male. He feels that he's got some issues regarding uh, his mother, probably. And, and so he feels that he deserves a woman's anger and control. So he deserves to be controlled. <laughs> And let's say because of that and because of his relationship with his mother, he, let's say his father was an abusive father and he always sided with his mother. So this is a male who always sided with his mother and was always trying to make his mother feel good, feel special. So he, he wants to make somebody feel special. But he's willing in the process to actually denigrate himself in the process. Now, because these emotions are actually compatible with each other, what will happen is energy will begin flowing from these chakras to the other person and cycle through the two of you. Does that make sense? Because the emotions are actually compatible. And it's because of the compatibility emotions, so this emotion starts connecting, this emotion starts connecting, and we have a cycle. One's, one's saying, you know, one's not angry with the man, the other one feels he deserves to be controlled, so he deserves a woman's anger. So we get this amplification of emotional energy. Does that make sense? That occurs. In other words, they think each other are really hot. So they really, yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so they're so attracted to each other, they just think, this person must be my soulmate. I'm just so blown away by this person. They're really turning me on. Just looking at them turns me on. And they don't understand that actually they're connecting on a couple of chakra levels that they possibly haven't connected with other people on. And if the injuries match each other in intensity and match each other in desire, what will happen is this cycle will rapidly grow between the two persons. And they will feel drawn together and therefore feel drawn into a sexual relationship. Does that make sense? Now, the only problem is, it's very hard to live with a man who desires to be controlled by a woman because oftentimes he's easily manipulated, but then the woman starts thinking, oh, he's too easily manipulated. He's a bit of a wimp, actually, now that I think about it, you know what I mean? And she starts going down that track. And so what happens with these kind of relationships, you get attracted together because of the emotional injuries. It's a burning attraction right at the beginning. And then what happens is the emotional injuries actually start getting heightened because of living together or being together more often. 
And as that occurs, you start realizing the flaws in the person that no longer attract you on other chakra level areas. So for a true relationship to continue and for, for sexual desire to continue for all of your life together at the same intensity or a growing intensity, more and more chakra areas have to connect, but they have to connect in truth, in harmony with love. And the problem is, in this case, they're not connecting harmonious with love, they're connecting harmonious with needs. So eventually a relationship like this dissipates in its intensity, dissipates in desire, and dissipates in <coughs> sexual intensity as well. So while they had that hot, oh, they're hot right at the start, that quickly fades, generally, because all of the other emotional injuries kick in, and they start seeing the person for really what's going on. So, if you feel a strong attraction to any person, whether you're in a relationship with someone else or not, is immaterial, if you feel a strong attraction to any person, look very sincerely at what you're getting from that person that makes you feel attracted to them. So there's something emotional that you're getting from this person that makes you feel so attracted to them. There's something emotional that's opening up a part of you that's, that's hurting and it opens up it, that particular part of you further that allows more energy to flow between you and that person and therefore more energy to flow through yourself which turns you on. So it literally, you could say literally, turns on the spirit body. It turns on like a light bulb getting switched on. And when our injuries are the most compatible that's when the light bulb really brightly glows. So it's fair to say that most attractions that happen at the moment are actually injury-based attractions? Yeah. You say? yeah. Would you be able to talk a little bit about what a soul-to-soul -soul attraction would be like? If that's yes. an injury-based one? Now, soul-to-soul -soul attraction, well, in terms of a non-injury-based soul-to-soul attraction, a non-injury-based soul-to-soul attraction would have every one of these emotions healed. So, for instance, the woman would not have anger with men. She would not have grieving issues with men. She would not want to feel special from men. She would, she would have, in fact, she would feel totally healed within herself. So when you're at one with God as women, you will feel totally healed within yourself and you'll feel like you don't need anybody, including your soulmate. You will feel like you don't need even your soulmate. Right? So let's say the woman's in that space. Just, just the woman, not the male. Let's say the male's still got lots of injuries. Well, what will happen is the woman will know who her soulmate is in that situation and only be able to connect to her soulmate by keeping each of these chakras or by actually maintaining the different things she's already learned. So in the base chakra, in the second chakra, she's learned a lot about self-worth, approval of herself as a woman and all those kind of things and all those things are healed. Because all of those things are healed, she is totally healed in that, pla in, that, in that location. So she might meet her soulmate, and because of her soulmate's injuries, not feel a sexual attraction to the soulmate unless the soulmate heals those injuries. She will also be speaking truth constantly to her soulmate. So every single thing she's going through emotionally, she'll be saying what that is to her soulmate. Uh, whether he wants to hear it or not, actually. Right, she will say it. Now, this is often difficult, isn't it, for a woman that's not healed. How many of you women find yourself shutting down your own feelings, shutting down what you're saying to your partner, because you think he won't want to hear what you've got to say? Right? That's pretty common, isn't it? So, uh, when you're completely healed, you won't feel like that. You will not shut yourself down in order for, to make the other person more comfortable. Does that make sense? So here we're talking about just one person. Once they're healed in themselves, they don't have any needy emotions coming from any other person. There will be no projections of need whatsoever coming from another person and no projections of needing to dominate the other person either. So there will be no neediness coming from themselves to actually browbeat or dominate or feel special within themselves because all of those things will be healed. Like, if you already know you're special, you don't feel like you need somebody else to show you, right? If you already know 
that you peeled all of your emotions about men and anger, anger, you don't, you won't automatically be projecting anger at men that you meet, will you? That will all be gone. So let's say she's in that space. Now, they can't have a soul-to-soul -soul connection completely until he gets into a similar place. However, he will feel very drawn to this kind of a woman, particularly if this woman is his soulmate. Because this woman has all of her stuff healed, and so he will feel some kind of draw to her. But he will still be dictated to by his own emotional injuries until he heals them all. Now, when he heals them all, there will be an energy connection. So we're talking now metaphysics rather than soul. There will be an emotional energy connection coming from the spirit body of one person to the other person and cycling between the two of you all the time. So it won't just be happening you know, when you want to have sex with them. It'll be happening all the time. And it'll be happening on every level. So, for instance, as I gain more self-worth, Mary is triggered in the sense of if she wants to control me, she'll be triggered with that. But she also likes it because I'm more like a man that she can rely on. Does that make sense? So there is often this double thing going on where the injury is being triggered, but there's also a nice feeling coming from the person as well. And so as you develop and grow emotionally and all of these chakras are healed, now you have a chakra connection with every single part of the other person. Now this is all coming from the soul, remember, not just from the spirit body, but the soul controls the spirit body's energies. So as the emotions in the soul get healed, what happens is the spirit body's energies get healed. And if you are with a in a relationship where another person's healing themselves in the same manner, working towards God, you will get to a point eventually where both of you are completely healed and the energy cycling between the both of you is completely dependent upon desire only and never dependent on need. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah, so sex in that state, pretty mind-blowing. Yeah. But can we say for people who are in a relationship now, the fact that each of you are trying to work on different injuries your physical sexual desire for each other can cycle as well because a, a lot of it, just by nature of the fact that none of us are at one with God and we're in a relationship, there are some injuries influencing that attraction. So as you start to work through your injuries, your part, you might feel less attracted to your partner until they deal with something or, or vice versa. But if that person is your soulmate, the more that you work through, the more compelled they'll be to work through. And also, once you work through each of you, work through your issues, then the connection will just feel stronger and stronger. I was thinking perhaps we could illustrate a few things from our own life together in the last year. And when Mary and I first met, I felt straight away that she was my soulmate, and I knew straight away that she was. But Mary did not feel anything at all about that. She was just interested in uh, what I was teaching basically, aside from the Jesus thing. So Mary then got very angry about the Jesus thing. Uh, and that, that of course caused her to feel like emotions of anger towards myself. Does that make sense? What that triggered in me straight away was emotions of rejection of my soulmate. So I had to go away for a few weeks and have a good cry about after wanting my soulmate for a long, long time meeting my soulmate and feeling straight away rejected by her. Does that make sense? Once I dealt with that emotion, and the way the law of attraction occurred was that Mary found out. Yeah, so I found out then that this is what AJ felt about me. And I wasn't really an intellectual decision, but I just felt compelled to contact him. And so we were in contact and started. I had this real pull towards him. So while Mary wasn't very happy with what I was saying in return, she still felt a desire to speak with me. And that desire within her grew until we started, until she started feeling some sexual desires for me. So by, by this stage, we're still, like now I'm overseas. You want to say? No, so, but then when I started to feel a sexual desire for you, that actually triggered some more things for you as well. Yeah. There was some... 
I went through while I was overseas some emotions of being unworthy of her desire. So then I had to feel those emotions, some shame and some shame emotions and so forth. Now that then caused her desire to increase and so eventually we decided that we'd actually catch up while we're overseas in England. So, um, so by this stage we're having a bit of phone sex and so forth. <laughs> Her, her mother was feeling that I was trying to convince her that, I, that she was Mary Magdalene, and all the time I was just trying to convince her to get into bed with me. <laughs> uh, it wasn't quite like that, but that's just an exaggeration perhaps. <laughs> but uh, what actually happened then is that Mary decided to come overseas. And our initial thing was that we were just going to, like, have a sort of a platonic sort of a relationship, which lasted about a day. <laughs> <laughs> then, then what happened was that uh, four days into us catching up with each other again, um, Mary went through this really difficult emotion. Which was triggered by you and was about you. Yeah. So her emotion was, you want to describe? Uh, it was grief and anger and, um, yeah, grief about the loss of my husband and anger at him for abandoning me and things like that. And it was directly, specifically directed at me. But she, like, for her, before she came to spend time with me, she thought, nah, I'm not Mary Magdalene, I'll show AJ, you know, he's just AJ and I'm Mary. Sure, we can get along, but it's got nothing to do with being Jesus and Mary Magdalene. And then she went through this really big emotional experience, which, yeah, yeah, but it's all linked, isn't it? She went through this big emotional experience, and, and then after that, straight away, there was a straight away a detunement from me sexually. Because what, what emotion's kicking in now? Fear. Fear's starting to kick in. Then a week later, she has another fairly big emotional experience where she wants to mind this being specific. Uh, where AJ rejected me sexually. <laughs> because I could feel that she was wanting me to actually get away from an emotion within her. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I was trying to stay in truth all this time. Like if any time I felt that Mary was using sex to get away from an emotion within herself, I would actually then say, no, I can't be involved in that. And she went through then a rejection, which then connected her with another emotion from the first century, which then frightened her even further, right? and then caused even more distance between us. Yeah, so I went from finding AJ quite attractive and wow, to in the space of a couple of months feeling I'm not even physically attracted to this man. Nothing. I can't, I can't feel anything and yeah. So, um, so at that point, we, we separated, right? So, because I felt I couldn't stay with her, obviously, she felt she couldn't stay with me uh, because she was no longer attracted to me. And I went through three months of very hard emotions, some of which I've talked about with you before, and some of which I think are even on DVD, unfortunately. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, you know, spent three or four hours a day crying about the whole situation, the rejection. There was feelings of anger as well about it. Like, what can I change about myself? I've already tried to change so much. And, you know, there's lots and lots of emotions that came up for me. And so I worked my way through all of those emotions. Now, as I was doing that, what were you doing? I was having a pretty hard time um, and feeling a lot of, I was also feeling rejection and but I couldn't really understand. Um, feeling very lost and angry, and especially when I f I'm very exposed because AJ was talking about all of this on DVD, and <laughs> sort of feeling a lot of injustice and what's going on and how can this be happening in my life and lots of things. I don't know if I worked through any of them. <laughs> she still did. Yeah. No, 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 I'm not. 
So, so what happened uh, during that period, obviously, is I was working through these emotions, and then I had this really big emotional release one evening. Um, Tristan, my son, was there, and uh, I was crying for a long, long time, and really in a lot of pain, physical pain as well, and, and I, was, I was on the floor in my, in my um, bedroom, just sobbing and sobbing for hours and hours, and, uh, and I just felt this big release about, and it was about how I was feeling about myself in respect to my soulmate. Two days later, um, Mary, uh, I went to a session in Gympie, and Mary decided that she was going to go, and she rang me up the, the next, that morning before, can I come? Um, so as soon as I dealt with that emotion, she felt drawn again. Does that make sense? As soon as I dealt with the emotion. Then, of course, it was like this dance going on. Um, um, I'd deal with an emotion. That would trigger Mary. She'd get afraid. She'd go off for a little while. She'd then deal with the emotion, feel attractive again, feel attracted again, come back. And then that would trigger an emotion in me. So I'd deal with that emotion. She'd then feel afraid. She'd go away again. And so forth. And that cycle happened over the next three or four months. Um, does that make sense, what's yes. going on there? So, so, and notice that her desire for me went down every time fear kicked in. Right? And then her desire for me increased every time she got through some fear. Does that be right? Yeah. Yeah. I also had a lot of realisations in that time about um, uh, myself as a woman and um, what I like to have in my environment to make myself feel safe and secure um, and learnt a lot about sexual projections that I um, I don't know really how to explain it all but um, that it was quite threatening for me to have just this one man, Jesus, really sexually attracted to me because it felt very unsafe that was a lot of the fear that was being triggered. I felt very vulnerable physically and emotionally because of some first century things. Um, but I, I felt very comfortable when there was no man coming on to me, but I felt that men found me attractive. Um, yeah, so, so we went through a part just a few weeks after we got back together again where Mary felt this feeling of a huge attraction for another man which really scared me. And I, it was not something that, I don't have a history of that kind of thing. Like I'm usually with one man and that's it. And, yeah. Yeah. So, so then she was encouraged by her friend to actually not tell me about it. And, 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 but she felt like she had to withdraw from our relationship again. Does that make sense? So she withdrew from our relationship. And although I felt what was going on, it was only a week later that I actually found out the truth about what, what had happened. And, and I knew straight away who the man was, by the way, too. And that was a very injury-based attraction. And in retrospect, it would have been much better just to speak to AJ about it, because I didn't want to act on it. But it was, it was an emotion coming from me that I didn't understand. I suddenly felt attracted to this other person, and I thought, oh, this is wrong. Oh my gosh, I'm ashamed of that. I have to withdraw from AJ. Whereas if we had spoken about it, would have, would have resolved, resolved it, it quite rapidly. quickly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so what had happened inside of Mary at that stage was that there's a, Mary's had these big issues of regarding security with regard to sexuality. And many of you ladies, by the way, have the same issue. And that is you only feel sexually attracted to somebody that you feel secure with. And the only people that you feel secure with are people you can control. Right? Does that make sense? So for many of you, you actually enter a relationship be not because of love, but because you have this strong feeling that this is a person you can be secure with and it feels like love. This is a person you can be secure with. This is a person you can be safe with. This is a person, and the reason why you can be secure and safe is because you can control him to a degree. Well, you can stay in control in the situation. They're not going to challenge. They're not going to uh, be bossy or... Yeah. Make you feel vulnerable, yeah. even. And so Ma Mary's history is that she's had lots of relationships, which is, I well, haven't had lots of relationships, but she's, each relationship she's had has been a relationship with a person she could control in this manner. 
Does that make sense? No, no, you're not an ogre. She, she's not an ogre, is she? But it's just an emotion. And the emotion was desiring to feel special, but also desiring to be in control, not out overtly in control, because Mary's not like that, but the subvert, subvertly, if you like, in control of the relationship, not allowing herself to be fully vulnerable to the male. Does that make sense? Now, with me, like, for a start, I'm saying I'm Jesus, so I could be crazy. That's a lot of, like, like insecure emotions. <laughs> then I'm saying she's Mary Magdalene, so that, you know, there's, there's other issues there. Then, of course, there's all these memories that start popping up that she's had of a life with me where she allowed herself to connect to me emotionally and sexually and got absolutely hammered emotionally because of it. I died. She went through this terrible period of distraught feelings and she, she had this strong feeling of like, like being with me is the most unsafe thing she could possibly consider doing. Don't do that, right? <laughs> but I also had another emotion. <laughs> it's true. Um, I also had another emotion about being vulnerable with a man. And I had never actually... Because AJ can feel all of your emotions. And he can tell you what they are. And so here's a man telling me my deepest, darkest stuff. And I never let a man see that before. And I would say to him, well, how can you be attracted to me if you can see all that stuff inside of me? You know? And so I realised a big pattern I had kept all my life was to be the good girl and the nice girl and just show the nice parts of me within a relationship so I felt quite secure. Um, and so obviously it was very scary to have someone like opening the Pandora's box and saying it's all laying out there. I still, I love you very much but and I felt really like very confronted and confused about that. So that of course made her feel even less sexually attracted to me. <laughs> Right. Well, you imagine, every single day, in fact, a lot of hours during the day, you're getting reflected at you an emotion that you just had that was out of harmony with love. It's the instant you have it. Right? And at the same time, the person doing it is saying that they love you. How hard is that? Right. I, I was feeling a lot of self-judgment and shame about myself, so it was very hard for me to then feel really attracted somebody else, I didn't feel attractive to myself. Yeah. So of course that causes the sexual desire of course to shut down again and to and to be very, very difficult to maintain. So can you see how fear and other emotions, desire for security and all those kind of things, can it affect the sexual desire? Now Mary's dealt with some of those emotions. For instance, the security emotion, uh, the need or the need to feel special emotion is something that you pretty close to work through now, isn't it? And, and as she's worked through that, now she, she understands that I do feel she's special, even though I know what emotions in her she's yet to deal with. Does that make sense? And so she still feels attracted to me now, whereas before she didn't feel attracted to me about that. He's pretty attractive, isn't he? <laughs> 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 I don't know what to say <laughs> I'm speechless, that's pretty high rear, eh? Uh, and embarrassed her. Um, yeah, so, so what's actually happening now is as we each deal with our own emotions about ourselves, what's happening is our desire for the other person is growing and our need for the other person is lessening. So we're having a less and less need for the other person to fulfil certain emotional desires and our desire for the other person is actually growing in intensity, which creates the sexual desire growing in intensity, <coughs> if that makes sense. So does it, is there any questions about that process that any of you have? Like, I wanted to explain that just to show you how, even if you meet your soulmate, how you're going to go through lots and lots of different emotions and how you're going to be very, very tempted, in fact, to withdraw from it because the emotions will be so painful. So during the period where myself and Mary weren't speaking to each other, I wrote her nearly 50 letters, right? Which she hasn't read. Um, they were all 
pages and pages and pages about how I was feeling in order to try to just connect with my own feelings. And I don't feel there's any need for Mary to read them. I was just connecting with my own feelings and using writing as a method of doing that. Does that make sense? So you can do that as well when you're in this state. Allow yourself to be challenged by the relationship you have with the other person. And you can use sex to challenge those things within the relationship as well, you know. Um, often, like, it's a good way to trigger an emotion if you become physically intimate, as long as you're willing to cease and go into the emotion. It's a very powerful way to trigger those very basic emotions. Um, Graham, you like that? AJ, Jen and I have had a lot of those same things that you were talking about there, and Jen's just been going nuts because it's just triggering you. Yeah. But there's one other thing that we just noticed recently, or and especially this morning, because we went down to Brisbane and, and um, saw Jen's sons, yeah. and there's something particularly interesting about my relationship with her sons, and I'm wondering whether you've noticed something with your sons with respect to Mary. Her sons relate to me in a way that they've never related to any man in their life. Yeah. And it's like, I'm more their father to them than yeah. their father was, yeah. or that her, her, her step, their stepfather was. Yeah. And it, it, we were talking about it in the car on the way up today, and, and it, it occurred to me that they're feeling, if we're the same soul, then they're feeling the same thing in me that they feel in their mum. And is that... There's and two like things they open going up on. to me in ways that they've never opened up to a man in their life ever. Yeah, there's two things going on though, that's one of them. The other thing is that many of their emotional injuries are identical to your own, and you don't have judgement about their emotional injuries, whereas mum does. Does that make sense? Or other people do. So, so that's why they feel like they can connect to you, perhaps even more than they can connect to mum at times. Does that make sense? Like, because their emotional injuries are very similar as well. Yeah, yeah. So when we, when we bring up children, our, like my, my boy's emotional injuries are very, very similar to my own, of course. And so if, we're, if we were opposite sex, if, if my, my boys were girls, then their injuries would probably be the reciprocal opposite of my own injury. So in other words, the way I would have brought up a girl would be I would have made her feel special, I would have made her feel like she's the princess, I would have made her feel like all of those kind of things. So she would have grown up thinking she's a princess and she can get away with anything with a man. Does that make sense? And so often, if I meet my soulmate, my soulmate's in that condition, then like if, if I had daughters, Mary would really connect to that condition. I'm not saying, but Mary has had those emotions. And so she would really connect to their condition. And that's what's happening a bit too with yourself. But because there is that intense emotion, there's the same soul signature. Like if your soulmate says the same soul signature, but there is also the emotions within you are very similar to the emotions within um, Jen's sons. Yeah. yeah, I feel that. Yeah, and that's why there's a deep rapport. Yeah. As you deal with those emotions, the rapport will lessen unless they deal with their emotions. But because you are the same soul, you know, if, if you're in, uh, if you're in the same if you're the same soul with regard to soulmates, you're the same soul. Because of that, they'll be drawn more intensely into dealing with those emotions. Basically, they will be helped to see what emotions they need to release by your releasing of those emotions. Yeah, I said that. Yeah. yeah. Is there any other questions? Yes? If they're not on the divine art path, But you're going through your emotions mm -hmm. and they just go into their fear and go off. Mm -hmm. Like, um, is there a, a response within them that is an unconscious response and they just deal with their emotions anyway? Or do they have to consciously deal with their emotions? No, a lot of times, if the person is your soulmate, in particular this is the case, um, if, like, what I found was when, when Mary went away from me and I dealt with my emotions, Mary could automatically feel a change in me without understanding what the change was, and then felt drawn back into the relationship automatically. I, I didn't actually pester her during that time or approach her during that time. 
and but she felt drawn back in because of my dealing with my emotion. Mary is dealing with her emotion. She wasn't, she no. Oh. Not, not during some of this period. Mary had decided in some of the period to not deal with any of the emotion at all. Uh, she decided at one point that she she'll go out with other guys and see whether she could forget me altogether. So so there was which I didn't do. Which she didn't do, but that's what she well you did it once, but that that's what she decided. <laughs> that's what she decided to do. So so she felt like she wanted to stay away from me, but deal my dealing with my emotions. There's a law of attraction between the souls. So yes, it can happen unconsciously. Yeah. So whether they're on the natural love path or the divine love path, they often it often can occur unconsciously. Yeah. On the part of the person who's on the natural love path. I also want to talk about um, projections. You know how people project and like, you know, you think it's your own emotions and then, then on the ground or something changes and then you realise that it's actually their emotions like you know, when you're getting the projections, it actually feels quite damaging. Like, I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. what I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, I suppose, um, and it just comes with time that you know that they're not your emotions. But how do you... Mm, you be careful here. Yeah. Every them. single projection you've attracted. So the projection, I have within myself, otherwise I wouldn't be watching. Um, you have a complementary emotion that attracted the projection. So for example, let's say men, you're walking down the street and men are whistling at you. You want that, you want them to whistle at you. At some level, there's an attraction where they are whistling at you and you, at the soul level, want that to occur. The key is to work through it emotionally. So whenever you feel projected, look within yourself and go, okay, what am I avoiding or what emotions are that for me? Yes, always. Yeah. Yeah, so I was I realised a while ago that because I've been daddy's little girl all my life and the special girl, um, but I've never been very overtly sexual or even really embraced my sexuality, that there I my law of attraction was I attracted men who sexually projected at me but not in an overt way. And that made me feel very safe and secure. So the issue within me was I don't feel safe and secure without having men around to sort of make me feel protected, but I don't want to be really sexual with anyone. So, I, you know, that was the injury in me that was attracting that. And it wasn't an unpleasant attraction before, like, before, I, didn't even, I wasn't even conscious of it, yeah. But someone I live with, <laughs> and and what, it was actually a really powerful thing to be pointed out to me, and I you know then went oh, oh there's so many emotions in that yeah, and my law of attraction has changed since I have started to deal with that yeah. yeah. So so the key is to notice that there is something going on. A lot of the projections you get, you will feel as pleasant. And the reason why is because you have a complementary emotional condition that wants that attraction or wants that projection. So you feel it as pleasant. There are other projections you'll feel as unpleasant and they are generally the ones you notice and blame the other person for, right? But both sorts of projections are the results of your soul condition. And both forms of projections are invited by your soul condition. So it's the law of attraction at work attracting something to you so that you can have it exposed within you. And like when I lived in the Middle East, I attracted something else. I attracted men being really... Uh, at different times, I attracted like really overt kind of um, comments or trying to touch me and stuff. And that was more related to the angry, angry feelings that I have about men and the way they treat women. So that was a different law of attraction. So Mary feels quite angry with men who are overtly sexual and don't care who they <laughs> share that with. And, and so that emotion was getting triggered within her. Does that make sense? And Jen, was it? Yeah, Jen. Um, 
I'd like to talk specifically about actually being in the sex act. I've hit my inner child. Yep. And so actually in the process of having sex with Graham, um, I reach inner child. And at the same time, I'm recognising my conditioning, if you like, um, that I'm trained to be the passive recipient of his advances. Mm -hmm. But what happens with Graham is that he's not able to or not wanting to or... Doesn't... Not, just, say what he, just say what he's doing, not what he's wanting. Um, say what he's doing. He's passive too. Yes. And in child. Yeah. And so um, my question is, because I'm female, I'm, um, I'm required because to be the recipient of the male in order to um, fulfil the sex act. He has to enter me, I have to be the receiver. But yet, in there's a social conditioning that happens. And when I hit child, I have no idea how to how to be in that. It's like I get frozen. I don't know what to, what to do, how to receive. And Graham doesn't know what to do either although I'm speaking to him and I don't really want to do that. But that's, and so what happens is we get frozen or one of us loses the desire for the other and it's like um, the conditioning that I recognise within me as a woman and from through all my injuries. But perhaps if you just stop for a moment, Mary about to answer some of the things and I will be too. So. When you hit child, do you, what do you mean you hit child? You you feel like you're a child or you feel some emotions? I, I feel like I am a child, that I have not grown sexually or been, the adult is not there, there isn't a learned uh -huh. process to respond sexually or, or and, as, yeah. And the point is, as children, like we don't need any learning or conditioning. As children, in our pristine state, we will just explore that situation. Do you know what I mean? But the thing is, that's happening with you is that you're freezing. So that's in an indicator that there's some emotion. You don't have any wonder about the act. You have this frozen feeling. So you, you're in fear. and. You see, it sounds like you're getting quite caught up on, okay, we've got to proceed. Instead of proceeding, can you just stop and go into what, what's the feeling I'm having here? Because there's a lot there. So, so it's about, you have some very terrified emotions regarding sex because of abuse, which you know you do have. And what you're trying to do is sort of skip over them to a degree. If you allow yourself to, if you're in the child emotion, as Mary said, you know, you and that that child was in a pristine state. All they'd want to do is explore. They wouldn't want it. They wouldn't get frightened. So the fact that they're getting frightened means that you have some fear and terror to work through, to experience, and then underneath that, probably some things you're afraid of with regard to the sex act as a child to work through and let yourself work through them. So what I'm really saying to you is a really huge thing for me because in my adult life. I have been the opposite. So it's sexually explorative, all sorts of, lots of partners, really running away from yeah, actual but then you were running away. intimacy. Yeah. And to have So fun. a child is intimate and exploratory. So they're connected with themselves while they're exploring. So the other life that you've had, you've been so it's almost been a big skip over everything and you've gone at it because it's such a huge issue for you. But you haven't been connected with yourself when you do that. Yeah. So the key is to go back to being connected with yourself. And this this idea of this conditioning that women must receive and 
sex is sex in its pristine state is a giving state. It, each person is in the act of giving at all times, um, and anatomy is, is just anatomy. Like it's not really there's there's no role you have to take on because of different anatomy. There is, seems to be a, a lot of uh, expectations about men and women and what they should be doing in sex. Mm. When it's not the women that have other giving and uh, the women are receiving, the men are the giving, or the opposite, or whatever. It's not that like that at all. Yeah, not at all. It, it's very important what Mary said earlier to understand is that sex is about giving, not about receiving. And how many, like, how many of you ladies, for instance, feel really rebellious about that? Like, in, in me saying that, because, like, we often hear things like, uh, for example, uh, like, but if I, if he comes in five minutes, and it takes me a half an hour, like, and he just finishes in his five minutes, I've given him what he wanted, now I need what I want. Like, how many of you feel that kind of thing going on sometimes with your relationship, right? And the, the key is, with all of these emotions, is to understand that, that actually sex for both parties is a giving thing for both parties. It's about desire to give, not desire to receive. You need to allow the reception and not resist the reception. So, so for both parties, this is the case, both parties need to learn to desire to give completely, but also both parties need to allow completely the receiver. Does that make sense? And the fact is a lot of us uh, women, we do have that injury because we haven't received historically very much. You know? And so there will be a lot of emotions, to, speaking from experience, to work through in order to reach a place where giving is, is the most important part of the act. Um, because there's a fear in there. If I give, then he'll take, and what will I get? And, and that's very much an injury. James, thanks. I'm concerned and confused with that. As I was listening to Jenny, I began to feel a very heavy, cold feeling in here. It just moved in towards my heart. I just felt I had no idea. No, understanding that I can't do it, but it's just really cold and as though I was contracting on that side, that my, my heart was really, really cold. It's on your left side and it's to do with the grief that you feel about, about women, particularly with regard to always having to give and not receive. And what, what's happening for you a lot lately is that there is this strong rage actually capping this very strong grief about how much you've had to give to woman. In particular, it began with your mother, so this rage is actually about your mother and how much you've had to give to her. You finished up worshipping your mother, basically, and giving everything that she, she wanted, but there's this huge sadness inside of you. And the reason why Jenny's discussion connected with you regarding that is because she has the polar opposite emotion uh, to that. So, so when she's speaking, she just triggers that emotion in, inside of you, this resistance that's covering a heap of grief to actually giving the woman now what they want. A few, a month ago, you were in a totally different state. And so you would always give the woman exactly what they want, even though you didn't consider yourself in the process. Now you're starting to connect with the fact that you haven't connect, considered yourself in the process. And now there's this grief that's starting to enter you on the left-hand side because it's just, it's starting to, you're starting to realise that actually your relationships with women have been sad and not as joyful experiences as what you've probably told yourself before. Thank you. Yeah, Any other questions at the moment? Because we've got quite a few questions as well. And Mary often asks me to talk about something that she's shy of talking about. And so what I'm trying to do with Mary is say, you can talk about that subject, okay? <laughs> you know about that subject. I'm not as articulate as <laughs> oh, that's not true. That's, yeah, that's not true either. 
And when I mean dishonesty, I don't mean purposeful dishonesty, you know, where someone's lying to me, but whenever I feel that Mary isn't being truthful with me about how she is feeling, I cannot connect to myself sexually with her. Right. So, so no matter how much she wants to make love, I cannot make love to her in those, that situation. And the reason what I and what I've found is every time I also feel an emotion from Mary that she wants to somehow control me sexually, I can't respond in that situation anymore either. All right. So as soon as I feel that emotion from her, straight away I, I I'm straight away um, go from erect to limp immediately and cannot respond sexually to her in any way until we discuss that emotion and work through that emotion. Does that make sense? So, most men are used to being able to become erect and have sex with anyone. What I'm saying is, the more and more you progress spiritually, you'll get to a point where the only person you'll be able to have sex with is your soulmate. And secondly, you will not even be able to have sex with your soulmate unless there is a connection going on at multiple chakra levels with regard to truth, honesty, openness, with regard to control, all of those issues would start, start to be triggered and resolved. And what I'm finding is as I deal with another emotion regarding emotions that I've had from women, I find that our sex life's in, impacted immediately and unless Mary then deals with the opposite emotion within herself, we can't <coughs> reconnect sexually. Does that make sense to everyone what's going on there? So this is, so that can be quite confronting, right? Because it's like, today we had great sex, tonight we deal with an emotion, tomorrow is terrible again. What's going on, you know what I mean? And often that actually occurs. Also, if, if I find if I am being driven by a need to please Mary, I cannot connect sexually. But if I'm, driven by a desire to please Mary, then I can connect sexually. So, can you see how, as soon as we get into neediness, you'll start actually realising these things going on within yourself? So, my injury emotionally with women has been mostly that I want to please a woman. So that's been my biggest injury emotionally to work through, in that I want to please a woman, no matter how badly she treats me, or no matter how bad I feel about pleasing her. Uh, and many of you men actually have this emotion uh, in the audience too. And so you go down the track of actually pleasing the woman, but actually disconnecting from yourself in order to do it. And that is a very damaging place to be. And it's going to detune you sexually as well. Now, many men get into this state then where they worry, where they become impotent. Now, impotence is totally curable, for a start, by emotion. But the inter inter impotence is driven by a deep anger and rage, in fact, with the opposite sex. That is not being allowed to be experienced. So if you're a male in a state of impotence, you are basically refusing to become sexually connected with the female and there must be some very, very strong emotions in you about that. And those emotions will be related to how you were treated as a child by women and in particular by your mother. Does that make sense? The key is to go into those emotions. If you have a premature ej ejaculation issue as a male, what will be happening there is that you actually want to become fulfilled yourself but refuse to fulfill your partner. So therefore there must also be some quite an deep anger based emotions within you towards the opposite sex to work your way through. Now many times what will happen in these situations is we will tell ourselves, no I don't feel angry with my mother or I don't feel angry with the opposite sex, I had a good relationship with my mother. You know, she always treated me nicely and I always treated her good and, you know what I mean? We go down this reasoning. The law of attraction is proving something different to you. And that is that you're ignoring 
how the inner, the child, when you were a child, felt. You're ignoring how he felt in this interaction with your mother. And he obviously felt controlled. He obviously felt manipulated. He obviously felt like he had to do everything his mother wanted. And he didn't like doing that, but felt he couldn't rebel, because if he rebelled, he wouldn't get loved. Does that make sense? The only way to get loved from a male, uh, in a, male, a male in that situation is to not rebel against his mother, do whatever she wants to do, and so forth. Now, if it's to do, if we're in a homosexual relationship, it will, might be not just our mother, it might be our father that we've got that issue with. In other words, our father controlled us. Our father, um, you know, pushed us around, pushed us into certain areas and so forth that we didn't want to go and we felt controlled. So look at the issue with your father. Does that make sense? Look at those issues from an emotional perspective. Carol? Hey, Jay, on the, um, the subject of intimacy, there's an awful lot of Vietnam vets who, who complain of intimacy. You know, that, you know, that's a big group of people. Is it about the war? Is it about their relationship when they come home? Or what, what is that? Um, it's about terror. Uh, obviously, persons who have been through war situations are not just going to have child emotions to deal with. They're going to have a very childlike emotions in an adult setting to deal with. So if a person has been through a traumatic experience as an adult, uh, that trauma will often severely affect their ability to connect with their own body. And so t terror is a major problem with regard to sexual connection. If we're in a terror state with regard to keeping ourselves alive, it's very, very hard to actually connect with our body's other needs. And so for many people who experience terror, they also will have deep disconnection with their own sexuality. But that is also connecting with childhood events regarding their life too. So it has to somehow connect with their mother and or, or you know, in, in a sexual way to the events. So, for example, often a person in terror, so let's say we, we're, we're, you know, 21 year old, we go off to war, right? There will be lots of emotions about women in that pro process that may occur. For instance, we may see many women being raped, for example, while we're there. Do you follow me? <coughs> uh, in this war situation. We may see women and children being murdered. We may see all sorts of very traumatic events, right? We may even personally be involved in it because of being part of the army that actually was involved in it, for example. Now that will create emo huge emotions of guilt and shame and other types of emotions that need to be released, which will certainly affect my sexual uh, identity. So there's lots, of, there's lots of very, very powerful emotions affected when we are in a war situation like that. Graham, you wanted to ask him? AJ, I know I've got loads of sexual injuries. Mm -hmm. uh, my upbringing is the opposite genes, in the sense that if there was any sort of abuse in my upbringing, it was the opposite, in the sense that, uh, like, I never saw either of my parents naked. Um, there was never any discussion of sex, or and, and it was always very, um, like, if something sexual would come on TV, there'd be this cold silence that would descend on the living room, you know? And um, so that's exactly the opposite of what Jen's experienced. And so I know I've got a lot to work through in that sense, but when you describe what you were saying, your own experience with Mary, that feels like a lot of what I experienced with Jen and that is at the heart of our sexual issues. And so I'm feeling, like, it feels like I have some connection with the way things should be, mm -hmm. and, and, and I tend to go with that, and I'm learning to trust that. Yeah. But, I, but I also know that I have these, these injuries that I have to work through, and, and the hard part is knowing which is which, you know? Can I, can I like, for example, if, it's, if, if an impotence issue is, is due to there being something that Jen needs, still needs to work through, well then that's an excuse for me not to do anything. 
So obviously every issue that you personally experience is your law of attraction. So that's the thing to firstly focus on every single time. So every single time Jen does something with you, whether it's harmonious with love or disharmonious with love, it's still your law of attraction. So for instance, if Jen during her normal day-to-day -day life has a tendency to push you around a bit, right, that is your law of attraction. So in other words, you're allowing her to push you around a bit. And there's an emotion inside of you that allows you to do that, and it's linked probably with your mother and you know trying to get approval from women and how you get approval from women and so forth, which means actually that you feel inside of yourself that when you're with a woman, you feel quite emasculated as a man. That kind of emotion needs to come out of you. If in the sex act, Jen then expects you to be dominating, right? To be the person who makes it happen, and you don't want to do that, then that's an expectation coming from Jen, sure but it's your law of attraction still. Does that make sense? So your law of attraction in that case is what she's doing is giving you an opportunity to explore this, this side of you that you haven't ever explored with women generally or you've shut down because of fear of control and fear of vulnerability. So allow yourself to be more open, allow yourself to be more vulnerable, allow yourself to see what happens when you actually connect with yourself and connect with your own sexual power, which is something you haven't been allowed to do or when you have been allowed to do it, it's always been for the woman and not for yourself. Yeah, that's very true. Like, um, my sexual relationships have been either one way or the other in the sense that I've been trying to please the woman and that just pulls the rug out from under it yeah. for me. Yeah. Um, or, I try, or I'm trying to, when I realised that was going on, I tried to um, be in tune in to my own feelings, my own inner self and do it the way I felt like it felt good for me. But when I would do that, that wouldn't live up to the woman's expectations and they'd give me the flick, you know? Yeah. And Jen's the first woman I've struck that doesn't do that, you know? Um, I'm amazed that even though we have these issues and how tolerant she is of it, and I know it's, 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 it's complementary injuries, yeah. um, but I'm just amazed at how tolerant she is of allowing me to just be my own self and, and, and follow my own things, even if it means that we don't have sex and stuff like that. So the, the key is that in the end, if you're not having sex on a regular basis, uh, there is obviously issues with either desire or control and other types of manipulation and other types of issues. So there's obviously issues with desire or emotional injuries. Now, our desire may be injured in sex. So for example, if you give me an example if your desire is injured, what that means is that you might have issues of shame about having a sexual desire. Right? And this is often imposed upon us as we're children. Like so that what what often happens is if we experience a desire for sex, we become if it's a male, we become erect. And then our mother noticed us like that and then felt disgust disgust at that at, at us doing that when we we're only five or six years of age. We felt her disgust and then felt we had to shut that down. So, so can you see how then my desire for sex is shut down as well? So, so that could have happened, right, in the sense of desire for sex being shut down. Or it can be an emotional injury about vulnerability being open. The key is to allow yourself to explore it emotionally every single time. To give you an example for myself, like, um, I, oh, I just did, it just skipped me too. That's very rare. <laughs> and I must have to say it at this point. But um, I, I was thinking about my relationship with Mary and how at times, oh, that's what it was. Uh, what happens with myself and Mary? I'm so used to giving to a woman sexually. And so I'm so used to being the person who, who does a lot of the work, if you like, in, in, the, in the act. And I enjoy that a, a lot. However, when Mary chooses to do that with me, I get very confronted because it feels like I'm not worthy of her attention, I'm not worthy of her sexual attention and so forth. And I've had some quite large issues to work through regarding that feeling, feeling when she becomes um, the person, I suppose you could say, who's, the, who's giving and she wants me to receive, I'm finding it very, very difficult to receive. So you'll find generally with sex, you'll either have you will, there'll be one of three different types of injuries. There'll be, if you have injuries with giving, you have injuries with receiving, or both. 
of those particular things. And the key is to allow yourself to work through those in an emotional way. So in your case, you have injuries with giving, and that's to do with some anger issues with your mother. You have injuries with receiving, and that's to do with some feelings and viewpoints you have about yourself as a man. And if you allow yourself to work through both those sides of injuries, you'll find in the end you will have a sexual desire that's constant every single day and, and obviously can be fulfilled as well if, if your partner is also in the same state. Um, you wanted to mention a bit about... Oh no, I was just going to say, some. You know, you're talking about your sexual response, that some of the things that, have, that I've been dealing with is kind of a mixture of those issues dealing with a sense of shame about my own body, my own anatomy as a woman, that has really affected my ability to climax, as well as uh, anger feelings towards men, and not being similar to what I was saying about not wanting to feel completely vulnerable. So when I feel completely vulnerable, feel, feeling quite threatened, and that often shuts me down, or has shut me down. Yeah, and not wanting, that, that real man anger of not wanting to give and not wanting to even share in a climax together is probably the major thing. So some of them relate specifically to me as a woman and a lot of them, oh, some of them relate to men in general and they all affect agent. <laughs> and some of them relate to me specifically because of the anger about what happened, like how she... How would, you, how would you call it? The, the anger that you have about me passing in the first century and your whole life being destroyed as a result. What happened before I passed is Mary gave her heart completely to me in the first century before I passed. And she gave herself to me completely sexually as well before I passed. That also meant that from that moment on she couldn't give herself to another. And so I passed. She was in her 20s. And, uh, and now felt like her life was ruined in so many different ways and the person she loved she wasn't with and so there was deep hurt in there and that deep hurt she's still going through now towards myself so so what what I what we're finding is that that definitely impacts upon our sexual relationship the generalized stuff is more to do with fear there's a lot of fear based things about what men will men will do to you and things like that isn't it but, and sexual shame, yeah. So can you see how, like, really, again, it gets back with this sexual stuff. It gets back to each single person in the relationship focusing on themselves only when it comes to dealing with their emotion. Not pointing the figure at the other person. They did this, they did that, they did this. Remember that it is all your law of attraction. So therefore, there's something sexual going on inside of myself that attracted this look at that let yourself feel that and if you go into that really rapidly your relationship can change so rapidly like we've had changes within hours of, of different things because of dealing with different emotions and allowing each of us allowing the different emotions to be triggered um ian up the back thanks i've been thinking about the difference between the caretaker and the caregiver and how that might relate to need and desire. Um, so assuming that the caretaker is the needy one and the one person giving out desire or in desire is the caregiver. No, I would say the caregiver is the needy one. Um, but, but in the sex relationship, obviously, um, we will swap between caregiving and caretaking quite freely, right? Now, if that doesn't occur and there's regularly a caretaker and regularly a caregiver, and it happens to be the same person each time, then that means that you have a, a relationship that is based on a codependent injuries that you need to look really seriously at what's going on underneath that emotionally. In the end, every relationship will be, like in the end, we will care for each other and we will be able to take the care from each other without there being one person doing it all the time. So in my history, I have become the caretaker, sorry, the caregiver, and the woman has become the caretaker, right? And, and that hasn't been swapping over. 
that in my history. Now, with my relationship with Mary, that, that's, that, that's what's happening. All of my caregiving emotions are being confronted. Like, why am I caregiving? What's going on? What's happening within me physically and emotionally and spiritually to cause me to want to give to a woman all the time without actually receiving anything? How do I feel about receiving? All of that's being confronted. Allow yourself to confront those things emotionally. So in other words, in the sex act, for example, if you know you're always the caregiver, you lay on your back <laughs> and relax and then let the other person be the caregiver and see how you respond emotionally. Because I can guarantee to you, a lot of you who are caregivers will have a lot of trouble with that. Does that make sense? Now, if you are the caretaker, then do the same thing. Lay the other person down, make them the caretaker, and you become the caregiver and feel your emotions as you do that. What are you feeling? Anger, whatever, you know, whatever emotions coming up, let yourself feel that. In other words, use your sexual relationship, if it's a relationship based on love, use your sexual relationship now as a way to explore why you have these emotional interests and allow yourself to work through them rather than avoiding sex. What a lot of people do in sexual relationship is they go down the track of avoiding sex. And they do this in so many different ways. One way is by one going to sleep three hours after the other one goes to sleep. So there's no way that they can have sex then at night, right? Or one waking up early and getting up and going, not staying in bed with the other because there's no way then that they can have sex in the morning. Does that make sense? Like we've, we found a little pattern developing between us where, where um, I would go to the loo in the morning and come back to bed, but Mary has, has to go to the loo in the house, which is actually 400 metres away from where we normally sleep. So of course then it's impossible to come back to bed. Does that make sense? So just the, we come up with these little ways even of controlling the sexual, our sexual interaction, when instead what we need to be doing is confronting our sexual interaction in our relationship. How's that? Is that confronting? <laughs> <laughs> to start actually confronting the sexual interaction rather than just working around each other? You know, a lot of times we work around each other. A lot of times what we do is we allow the situation to develop where we know the other person doesn't really want it. So what we do is we don't confront them about that because we want to keep our relationship or we want to keep our relationship smooth and we don't want to have arguments or don't want to have fights and we don't want to do this and we don't want to do that. So in the end, we don't confront the issues between each other. Does that make sense with everyone? If you do that, you will end up with a codependent relationship, not dealing with your injuries, never being at one with God. If you do that. If you allow each other to challenge the other's emotional experiences, including the sexual emotional experiences, what will happen is you'll both be growing towards God and towards each other in the process. Uh, This is not. This is a question, but not necessarily the sexual side of stuff. Um, with the men, a lot of the time you say it's an emotional base being with your mother or the ladies of their father. The, the mum and dad seem to come fair to the fact when you're talking about it. It's, it's, it's actually a combination of father and mother, but yeah. we'll talk about why. But is it also possible that, um, like the years I went to primary school with, with female teachers and that sort of thing, that in that era, it was a very prudish era. Is it always... Are my emotional problems sometimes? The way you speak, it quite often it's a problem I've got with my mother. Yep. But I'm one of these people where I think about my childhood with my parents and I can think, well, it wasn't that bad. I, yep. I have got issues with my mum, but not, not lots, but maybe more than I think I have. Yep. Could some of those emotional problems be based on my grade one teacher, who was a female and, and all that sort of thing? Yes, um, can I, there's sort of two parts to your question. Firstly, many of you are not allowing yourself to see your true relationship with your parents. Many of you feel that being good parents, they were pretty easy to get along with. And, you know, we had our ups and downs occasionally, but it wasn't that bad, everything was fine, and I really had a good relationship with them in the end. But to be frank with you, that is covering over lots of different emotions. Right? Myself and Brian were having a conversation last night 
And Brian mentioned that he, down his leg he has this huge rash, right? On his left leg, down the side here. And I was saying, that has to do with unresolved rage with your mother. And Brian's next comment was, but I had a fantastic relationship with my mother. In fact, it's my father that I had all the trouble with. Right? But the actual physical body is saying quite different. So often what's happening is we are boy dealing with the core in, in injuries with our parents. Now, our school teachers happen when our, we're usually four or five years of age onwards, right? Here in Australia. Now, obviously our law of attraction is already quite established from our parents by that stage. So even if we attract teacher after teacher that's female, there is an attraction going on that's based around our parents' attractions. So, so while those certain people can certainly damage you, and certainly between the ages of zero to seven, most of the damage does occur, and until we start sorting out that that was their problem rather than ours, so we start getting a mind of our own, if you like, and start sorting out who's got the problem, before that time, oftentimes we internalise all of our issues and problems or externalise them greatly, but that is totally dependent upon <coughs> our parents and what's going on with our parents. So the reason why I'm bringing up the issue of parents over and over again, and in fact last weekend we had the weekend about parenting, and for those who came, there wasn't that many who came, interestingly enough, uh, to that there was about 50 I think who came to that in Brisbane. And every single one who came realised how much of an impact this parent thing go, is having on us as children in very insidious ways. So often we haven't received lots of verbal, emotional, physical abuse that we can recognise. But the reason why we can't recognise it is because it's so fine that we hook into it and un unfortunately become so hooked into it that it's not till later in life that we realise how much through the law of attraction it's affected our life. Maybe, um, I don't know how comfortable you feel about saying that with your parents, like... It certainly, I, um, I was raised with lots of hugs and I was told that I was loved a lot and um, I would have said that I, and I still say that I had a fantastic childhood, but I'm 30 now and I have a lot of stuff that comes directly from my relationship with my parents and as each week goes on I go, oh, oh, and there's that and there's that. And it doesn't, I don't feel, um, I'm just right. checking if this is true, yeah. <laughs> I don't feel in a place of judgment of my parents about it. Like, the truth is they did the best they could and they actually endeavoured to be very loving, gentle parents. But they weren't perfect and there were things that they did that had an impact on the way I relate to men, the way I relate to women, the way I relate to myself that I need to clear away now. So I have to, in a sense, take the rose-coloured glasses off and really go back to what the little girl felt because she's the one who needs to be healed. And, um, yeah, I don't necessarily feel that... Like, I still feel that my parents did a pretty, you know average or above average job, but they, they have their own injuries that they have, that I just absorbed as a natural part of being a child. So for example, let's say you are a person who um, got a lot of approval from your parents. So you've got lots of approval, lots of acceptance and so forth from your parents, but there might have been an emotional hook in your parents which was, we're going to keep giving you this approval as long as you agree with us. So you'll grow to be 30 or 40 even perhaps before you start not agreeing with them. And then when you start not agreeing with them, you find there, what happens to the relationship now? It's starting to sour a bit, right? Now the reason why that is the case is because we've actually been so hooked into getting this approval that we've automatically done what the parent wants us to do. And as a result of doing what the parent wants us to do, they are all happy all the time because they're happy with us all the time and we feel really happy, but the instant we do choose something that, that's something way out of their left field that they can't cope with, now we've got a major problem. Now the, now the hook is exposed. Now the emotional damage is exposed. So for many of you, you'll find actually that you have these hooks into your relationships with your parents, that, and, and even sexual hooks into the relationships with your parents, that are only exposed through the law of attraction later on in life. And then you start then you start to see, ah, it's because of that particular thing going on. 
So for instance, if you're a woman whose daddy's always thought of as special, now you're going to grow up feeling special as a woman, right? You're only going to be attracted to men who view you as their queen, as their princess, and all that kind of stuff. Now any man who wants you as an equal, you're not going to be attracted to. You're going to think you are, and you're going to think that maybe even the man you're with thinks that. But once you start analysing it, as soon as he doesn't give you those special emotions, what do you do? Do you get angry? Well, if you do, obviously this isn't a loving relationship if you're getting angry. So, and it all comes from just daddy feeling you're special. And yet you might not have ever realised that until you entered a sexual relationship with somebody else. Do, do you follow me? So can you see how, like a lot of the links are to our parents are quite insidious links, not even easily determined, and they're only usually exposed through the law of attraction later in life. So, oh, sorry, Paula had a comment too. Can you remember it, Paula? Sorry. It's okay. I was just going to ask if you could say a few words about the generational stuff and the impact on that, because I think that helps to understand a little bit. Yeah, yeah, bear in mind when we're talking about parents, um, when we're talking about parents, understand that we're not blaming specifically your parents. Because you've got a grandparent and a great-grandparent, on both sides, by the way, here. So you've got great-parent, parent, great-grandparent. Then you've got parent, great-parent, grandparent. So these are great-grandparents. Then you've got the next generation, the next generation, the next generation, the next generation, and then you, right down here. Now, where did your parents' emotions come from? from their parents. And where did their parents' emotions come from? Their parents and their environment, what they had to deal with. And where did their emotions come from? Their parents and their emotions and their environment, what they had to deal with through their life. And what, more specifically, they didn't deal with through their life. So can you see how, when we say it came from our parents, it does come directly through our parents through this chain. But often we're dealing with great-grandparents and great multi-trans, like I say, transgenerational emotions being transmitted down and down and down that are unresolved. So our own parents have transgenerational emotions inside of them that are unresolved because their parents didn't resolve them and so forth and so forth and so forth. And this all started from this issue of self-reliance. So as soon as we get away from God, basically we start damaging ourselves and our environment. And as soon as we start damaging ourselves and our environment, we have emotional injuries as a result, and those emotional injuries then get passed down and down and down and down through multiple generations. Now, what I'm suggesting is, if you focus on your own emotional injuries, understand where they came from, understand what the linkage is, what will happen is you'll heal your emotional injuries, and the next generation won't have to do it. So it's your gift to the next generation. Right? Now, unfortunately, that hasn't been understood, understood very much. The multi-generational passing down of emotional injuries hasn't been un understood very much, and so therefore, we often ignore it. So when we say, look at your parents, look at, if I've got an issue with women, this is about my mother stuff. It's about, specifically, we could call it about my women stuff, but the problem with that is we actually then start looking at our women relationships right now rather than seeing that it's actually a childhood emotion so it had to have something to do with our, the women surrounding me when I was a child. Now who's the woman most surrounding you when you're a child? It's your mother. Now it can be other people, obviously teachers, it can be all sorts of other people, aunts or whatever, but in the end it's a woman emotion most probably associated with your mother. But her emotion came from emotions about men and you know, and so and women and her. You know what I mean? It just keeps going back and back and back. The key is to not blame. The key is to now say, all right, this is about my relationship with mother. What that will do is help you connect emotionally as a child to that emotion. So if you can go that way, you'll find you'll keep connect quite easily to these childlike emotions that are defining you now as adults. But if you skip over it, which many of us do, 
we ignore it and say, oh no, our relationship with mum was fine or our relationship with dad was fine, they were nice people, I can't blame them. I'm not suggesting you blame them, I'm just suggesting you have to come to terms with the truth. That's all. Does that make sense? Alright. Hey Jay, I don't know, you can probably hear me. Uh, no, can I, no, can I ask Louise, because she's oh, had sorry. her hand up before yourself? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, this is following on from that. Um, like, in my bedroom as a child, um, I used to hear my parents making love. And yep. I knew that my father was just using my mother for sex. Probably because I don't know that my mother used to tell me every day that men use you. And my father used to tell me every day that women are useless. And um, <laughs> so I have, I'm very, I have a part of me that's very attracted to men and men sexually, you know, sexually attracted. And there's also a part of me that I'm repulsed, yeah. and I'm repulsed about my sexuality. Um, so how do I heal that repulsion? And also, I've got some shame around sex as well, which I think I've got from my parents. Um, but, like, is it just going, I'm, I'm not sure, and I was sexually abused. So restate your, your father and mother statements again. Just restate um, them. Mother my said... Mother Men use you. Men use you. And she only told me I was the sort of scapegoat. She didn't take other seconds. Um, okay, so my, men use women. My father said that women are useless. Women are useless. <laughs> so I, I haven't had a lot of long term relationships. Understandably. <laughs> Which I blame myself for. You don't need to. Yeah. No. It's a law of attraction because of some unhealed emotions, obviously. Now let's look at the men use women emotion that was in your mum. Now, that is a very angry statement, isn't it? Well, my father dominated my mother in a violent way, not physically violent. Yeah. My, my mother was very submissive. Yes. Did things with his back. Yes. Yeah. So she learned to be deceitful is the only way to get what she wanted. She didn't leave him. She learned, she learned that to be deceitful was the only way she could get what she wanted. There's a lot of emotional things being pushed on you about that. But let's just look at this one statement, the men use women statement. There's anger about that. That was in your mother. Right? So she has this deep rage towards men because men always use women. It's a multi-generational rage towards men. The only way you can actually release it is connect to your anger about it that men use women, right? Get, get, really get into that, like really express that. So, you know, this is where baseball bat and boxing bag and everything is really yeah, handy. I can't quite trust men. That's quite You're not going to until you release this yeah. anger. You will never, while, while you have this belief in you, you will never trust a man. You have the most, must, the most trustworthy man in the universe will come along, yeah. want to have a relationship with you, you won't be able to trust him while this emotion is inside of you. The only way to release it is there's a capping of it, of the anger or the rage towards men. Connect with that rage towards men. What, what Mary does sometimes is go out with a stick and belt some things outside and yell and scream and swear and so forth. So yeah, it, and verbalise it, like really. I find if I start verbalising what's there, stuff comes out and I go, oh wow, you know. And I find a huge difference in her just connecting with the anger. After she connects with anger for an hour or two, she comes back like almost different person. Right? So connect with your anger and your rage, but then underneath that is grief about being used as a woman. So allow yourself to connect to the grief about being used as a woman. Once that emotion leaves you, now you won't believe that in your heart anymore. The problem at the moment is you believe this in your heart, in your soul. This is a belief that exists within you. That you got from your mother. Right? Now let's look at the father side. This is your father's reinforcement of this emotion. Right? Women are useless. So in other words, he would have sex, he'd basically rape your mother most nights, right? And then say women are useless. Now how does that feel? It is abusive. It's totally abusive, right? So what do you get from that? Men are abusers. Like, like, and also a feeling inside of you that your own father thinks you're useless. Yeah. There's also that emotion there. 
So allow yourself to connect to that emotion. How do you feel about that? Well, if capping it, you might have some anger about that. Well, I've spent my whole life proving that I'm not useless. Exactly. But I haven't really succeeded in proving that to myself. Exactly. Because you have a belief that women are useless from men's perspective. Yes. Inside of you. And the only way you are ever going to believe you're useful as a woman from a man's perspective is for you to release that emotion. Does that make sense? Now, when you release that emotion, you'll no longer think that men think women are useless. So you will never attract a man again who thinks you're useless. And you'll also be released, and you'll feel quite relieved, you'll be released of this desire to prove you're useful. Yeah, which is very tiring. Which is tiring and exhausting, and it's, and it's taking a lot of energy out of you at the moment. And I've attracted some men who feel that I'm just horrible, and I, I don't know where that's come from, what I've done. Um, it's very much related to your father and how he viewed and treated women, right? So, so there's a, there are a lot of men with the injuries towards women of like, oh, we're going to just use them for sex because they don't connect to us emotionally, they don't care about us emotionally. Like, and the truth is that your mum, before she even met your dad, had this emotion, right? And the truth is she never did connect to your dad. Right? The truth is, their whole relationship was based on the law of attraction, basically around those two beliefs. Right? And now those emotions have entered you. The key for you now is to release them emotionally so the truth can, be tr to, can enter you. At the moment what's happening is that that emotion exists within you, no matter how much you intellectually try to work around it, it still exists within your heart. When you release it, which is releasing the anger about it and then the grief about it, when you release it, you'll actually say to you, you'll actually feel inside of yourself, hey, and you'll notice in your law of attraction that you'll start attracting a lot of men who don't use women. In fact, you'll start attracting a lot of men who actually want to help women. Yeah, that'd be amazing, eh? Yeah. And then on the other side of things, when the women are useless thing, when you release that, you'll start feeling, hey, I'm not useless anymore. You actually feel it inside of you that you're not useless. And then you'll feel, why in the hell am I overworking for? Yeah. <laughs> like, you won't feel like overworking anymore and proving. Yeah, you won't feel like you have to prove yourself because you'll know that you're not useless even if you don't work at all. Yeah. Right? You'll, you'll still feel useful inside of yourself as a woman. Yeah. Right? And you'll actually start attracting men who believe you're actually beautiful and useful. Even when I'm not working. Yeah. Even when you're not working. Like, you know, instead of, instead of trying to get them to think you're beautiful and useful, you'll have men come up and feeling you're beautiful and useful, but you won't have to work at it anymore because it's automatically been released from your soul. Thank you. There's still some other emotions, though, about sex and how you feel about yourself sexually because of both of your parents' emotions. So even once you heal those ones, you still have to look at those when you feel Sexual based, yeah. Let's look at what's happening sexually, if we can, about your mum and dad too. Like every, most times you heard them having sex, knowing that your mum's emotion was she didn't want it. Yeah. You could feel it, right? You could feel she didn't want it. Yeah. Yeah. So how did that make you feel with regard to sex act itself? Um, Why did your mum not want it? What's the feeling inside of you? Because my mother, my father never how she felt or was never kind to her. No, there's a deeper reason why your mum didn't want to but go with your feelings. It's related to these things. Remember, your mum's feelings about sex happened before she met your father. I think she was repulsed. So, yeah, so she's repulsed by sex. I mean, mum was 19, she died a couple of years ago, so it's on. So all of her life she's been repulsed by sex. Basically, that's that's the feeling I feel in her, even now, right? Even though she's passed. So, so she's been repulsed by sex. So, what kind of a man is she going to attract with regard to sex? Just, a man who treat who treats her in such a way that she finds sex repulsive. Yeah, yeah. That's what kind of man she's going to attract, and that's exactly what she attracted. A man who basically raped her every night. Yeah. Of course, that's repulsive. Now, what's the emotion inside of you is with sex is repulsive. So how do I release that? That's the question. 
We'll talk more about how to release it next time we get together. But how do I release sex is repulsive. That's a pretty hard emotion, isn't it? So it's a pretty hard emotion, isn't it? So how do I release that? What I do is I lay down with a loving partner, or even with myself initially, I start masturbating, looking at myself in the mirror, you know, letting myself feel my sexual response, and all the shame that comes up, I go into it. I feel it. I feel the shame, the hot feelings of shame and dirty, all of those terrible feelings, I allow myself to feel it. And I keep doing that, so I do that every day. So I masturbate every day, deal with that, you even look at porn if you need <coughs> it to, to sort, sort it out. Do that every day until you no longer feel repulsed by your own body sexually and you can actually enjoy your own sexual response. Then you'll attract a loving relationship. Then go into that loving relationship and actually do the same but now with, with the person touching you. And allow yourself to feel all the feelings of a man being repulsed by you, you know, by your body and all those kind of, allow yourself to feel all those feelings in the process. Now that's going to require quite a loving man and it's also going to require that you love yourself during that process. But don't be afraid of doing it because this sexual area of our life is such an important area of our life in terms of exercising desire. You don't want to run away from it, you want to run into it. So allow yourself to do that. Does that make sense? So you can see that Dad also had some things like women are sexually repulsive. Did he? Because my mother was quite an attractive woman. Yeah, but your dad had some issues like the sort of the like the uh, what do they call it the the Madonna whore type uh, conundrum that he faced basically. You know, he had a sexual desire for a woman, but his own mother uh, tried to suppress the sexual desire that he had for women. Do you, do you follow me? So, he, so he's in this mode of, you know, women are repulsive, but, we, but I actually want them sexually, you know, and, and feel terrible about yourself in it. That's how he was, but uh, that's how he was in the relationship. But he actually felt that women are repulsive sexually, but he felt like he had to have sex with them because he still had a sexual desire. But you can see the... So really, there's really dark emotions going on between your parents. Yeah, we well, feel all these things as a child, yeah. all of those things. Any tiny little bit of shame a parent feels, any tiny emotion like this you feel, you, you're going to feel it as a child. And it's going to carry on with you the rest of your life until you release it. Yeah. So don't be afraid to spend a lot of time experimenting with sex. Firstly, with sex with yourself, right? So experimenting with that, working your way through all of those kind of issues. And then you'll attract a loving partnership and then work through the sex issue with your loving partner. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. No worries. And... Thanks. AJ, you were saying before about the generation thing, yep. and about if we deal with things, yep. that heals it for our children. Yep. Uh, I'm not saying yeah. it automatically heals no, it for our children. No, what I wanted to know was, if I deal with things now, mm -hmm. will that help things that happened in the past with my children or only things that happen in the future? Um, it helps both. Both? Yes. Uh, but obviously if we have any unborn children, it helps them immensely because we've released the emotion so they'll never have that emotion to ever deal with. So that's fantastic for any unborn children. But if a children is born or growing up or an adult, then yes, anything we deal with as a parent will certainly affect them greatly. My suggestion is have a look at the parenting video we did last week because that goes through all of those kind of uh, things, the relationship between parents and children and dealing with things as parents and feeling them as children and so forth. Yep. One other thing. Um, hmm. um, when I, as I grew up, uh, when you were talking about parents, um, I always thought of God as Father, yep. right? Um, now things happened in my childhood and until I was 40 I could not talk to anybody about it yeah. and um, I felt I was a bad girl yeah. and I, everything that happened to me I thought was God punishing me for yes. being a bad girl. Yeah. Now I think I've found a God of love since then yeah. but is that just my um, 
a relationship with God or is that tied in with my relationship with my parents? Definitely. Definitely. It is. Yeah, so let's say this is you. This is you. Here's your parents, your mum and your dad. In the uh, parenting uh, talk that we did last week, we said that these parents are actually surrogates for God. So, so how they treat you starts defining how you believe about God. Do you follow me? Every single emotion you feel towards God is going to be an emotion that you actually did feel at some stage towards one of these parents. So in a, in a non-sexual way, all of the emotions you feel towards your mother, you will also project at your heavenly mother, God. All the emotions you feel towards your father, you will also project at your father, God. So if your father was punishing a father who punished you for misdemeanors, you will then believe God's a punishing God. If your father abused you and then told you that you were a naughty girl doing it, then every single emotion you go through with regard to God, you will believe that you're the naughty girl all the time. Do you, do you understand? These are all projections you'll receive. Now, if we look at it sexually, there's even greater damage there because sexually defines your identity as this person as well. So, so now all of your identity is tied in with the emotions that are tied in between your mother and your father and what was happening between them both. And sexually, you're going to have lots of sexual injuries that are related to those two people and their relationship with each other that you will also project at God. And this is why you can't become at one with God until you've worked through those injuries. So, would having a stepfather... Not... That just adds another person in the mix. Right. Yeah. There's and having an adoptive, an no, adoptive mother, another person in the mix. So it doesn't matter if my father, my father, I didn't see after I was three and a half, so that doesn't have any relevance. It's... Um, your father, who you didn't see before, who was there before three and a half, certainly had an impact on your life. And your stepfather has also had an impact on your life. Both of them have. And how, and how that's affected you emotionally has affected how you view God on the masculine side. This is why many of you feel comfortable when I say God is a mother, but don't feel comfortable when, you say, when I say God's father. And this is why I mix the two terms quite a lot when I'm talking about God being mother or father, is because I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the emotional injuries that we have and just responding by saying that God is the opposite person you want them to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. So allow yourself to deal with both injuries because if both injuries will be certainly reflected by the injuries you've received from your parents. And by the way, this is not... Remember, you can't blame your parents per se because it's a transgenerational injury being imposed upon each one of those people and then upon yourself. So in the end, it's due to all of these transgenerational injuries that have caused these problems inside of ourselves. The key is for us to identify them, see them, release them, like a child would, in full. The problem is that when you felt something with your mother, she didn't let you release it. When you felt something with your father, he didn't let you release it, and that's why you still have it. And all we need to do is release it, and we'll, we'll